Hi, I'm Jerry Miles. Welcome to my studio. In my last video, I covered the most important aspect of the painting process, that of getting tone and contrast under control. This time, I'm going to talk about another important subject, that of colour mixing and how to manage and control colour harmony. It's a complex subject, but what I'm going to attempt to do is to present it as a step-by-step plan. I'll start at the very beginning with primary colours and go right the way through to what I believe is a practical application of colour theory. So let's start with a few definitions. There are only three primary colours, red, blue and yellow. The purest of these in any colour assortment can't be created by mixing together any other colours. Secondary colours are mixtures of any two of the primary colours, and these fall under the headings of purple, orange and green. If you take a secondary colour and add a small amount of the third primary that's missing from the secondary mixture, you create a tertiary colour. Now, by adding more of this third primary, you're in fact neutralising the secondary colour and it will become less intense and tend towards grey. These are the only four terms that I'm going to use to define colour. You'll hear other terms such as hue, tint, shade, pigment, but let's keep it simple and stick with those four. The only other thing I'll mention is tone, which is, of course, the difference in darkness and lightness of colours. For the colour mixing exercises I'm going to be using a very limited palette. In fact I've chosen three colours which by my judgement as close as you can get to the pure primary colours. And these are Madder Lake, Thalo Blue and Cadmium Yellow Medium. The palette's completed by Titanium White. If we take one of these primary colours on its own, then the simplest way that we can modify it is by adding white, which changes the tone of the colour. For each individual primary colour, we can add more and more white and build up a monochrome tonal scale with discrete tonal steps, each step having its own tonal value. We can do this for all three primary colours, but of course the deepest yellow tone starts well down the scale of the other two. It is possible, of course, to change the primary colour tones by adding black, which is something I never use. I mix all of my dark tones from the three primaries. It takes an even amount of red and blue with a little touch of yellow to get a very dense black. Having black in your palette is the quickest way to get muddy colours. By mixing your own black and then adjusting the amount of red and blue, subtle colour tones can be worked into the darkest passages of a painting. I'm now going to demonstrate to you my approach to colour mixing. I call it vertical and horizontal colour mixing, not terms that you'd associate with mixing uh, paint on a palette, I admit, but it's the way that I get quickly and efficiently to the colour that I want, and let's face it, that's what it's all about. So if you'd like to follow me, hopefully it'll help you too. We all probably learned the very basics of colour mixing at kindergarten or play school. If you mix the primaries red and blue together, you get purple. Then if you take a blue and mix it with yellow, that gives us green. 
and the third if we mix red and yellow together that provides us with an orange. And these are the fundamental colour mixes. In vertical colour mixing I now go a step further, creating tertiary colours by adding a small amount of the missing primary colour in the secondary colour mix. This means adding a spot of yellow to the purple, red to the green and blue to the orange. I must emphasise that this third primary must be added sparingly. It's better to do this gradually until you reach the desired tertiary colour. It's also important to understand the strength of the primary colours in mixing. Thalo blue is very powerful and should be used sparingly. The process of adding a third primary to the secondary colours is the first step in neutralising the colour. You can see that the secondary and tertiary are in the same colour family, but in the step down to the tertiary the colour has lost its brilliance. The further colours drop down the vertical mixing scale, the more readily they harmonise with one another and add interest and subtlety to a painting. In the final stage of my vertical colour mixing, I add still more of the missing primary to the tertiary colour and this has the effect of suffusing the colour still further towards grey. These resulting greys can be referred to as warm greys, neutral greys or cool greys. These are the poor cousins of the colour range but are an absolutely vital element to landscapes, portraits and still life paintings. The greys are useful in creating aerial perspective and as a background will add vibrance to dashes of secondary colours. To summarise, for vertical colour mixing we first make secondary colours by mixing two primary colours together and from this we get the purple, green and orange. Next we add a little of the missing primary to create the tertiary colours. And finally, we add a little more of the same missing primary to obtain the grey colours. Now I'm going to mix horizontally, and you'll soon see what I mean by that. I'll start by mixing a purple secondary colour and place it in the middle of the palette. What I'm aiming for here is a mid-purple and that's to say a purple that's not strongly biased towards red or blue. To the left of this mid-purple I'm going to mix one with a high proportion of blue. It can still be classed as purple because it contains red and this I will call blue-purple. On the right hand side I'll mix a purple with a high proportion of red which I'll call red-purple. And in my terminology, all three of these colours are secondaries, since they only contain two primary colours. I can do the same for green and orange, mixing to the left a blue-green and to the right a yellow-green. To the left of the mid-orange is a red-orange and to the right a yellow-orange. Horizontal colour mixing provides us with a complete range of secondary colours. Within this secondary colour range, if we take the greens as an example, I'm not interested as to whether a colour is called hooker's green, sap green, olive green or emerald green. To me, they're blue greens, mid greens or yellow greens. Working from a horizontal mix of greens, each tone or step or value can be mixed vertically to find its tertiary and grey. Furthermore, any secondary tertiary or grey colour can be mixed with white to produce a tonal scale. This approach to colour mixing can be summarised on this colour matrix chart. In the horizontal mix we find all of the secondary colours and in the vertical mix the tertiary and grey colours. Obviously this chart could be expanded in both directions, 
by adding more intermediate secondary steps and more tonal steps. But this is sufficient to show us the colours that can be mixed from our three primaries, red, blue and yellow. I'm not an advocate of making colour charts. They are laborious to produce and I'm not convinced of their benefits. Over the years I've made many of them. Each time that I changed from watercolour to oils or acrylics, or I added a new colour to the palette, I made another colour chart. Now, I'm not saying they're a waste of time, and I know that there is a benefit from them that you learn how your colours behave in mixes. But at the end of the day, whatever blues, reds and yellows that you choose as the primaries for your palette, if you mix them together, you're going to get purple, green and orange. And then if you add the missing uh, primary to the mix, you'll get your tertiaries and greys. Now it's all very well having discovered all the different colours from secondary to tertiary to grey that I can mix from my three primary colours. But when I'm sitting out there in the field looking at the subject that I want to paint and I want that particular colour, how do I go about finding it and mixing it? Well, let me show you. For the purpose of this exercise, I'm going to make a rough colour sketch of this scene on the River Avon at Bantham in Devon, England. I'll be using the same limited palette that I use to demonstrate vertical and horizontal mixing. And apart from the pink of the house and the deep blue of the boat in the shadow, the rest of the picture is in the tertiary and grey colour range. I'll start by considering this light area of cliff and hillside on the far side of the river. In order to get to the colours that I want, knowing that they're tertiary and grey, I first have to think horizontally and determine the closest secondary and then to mix them vertically and add white to get down to the colour and tone that I need. What I see here in secondary terms are mid-greens. And in the lighter area here I see red-orange. And in the area of heathland on the other side I see a blue-purple. For the purpose of this exercise, I'll be mixing colours very deliberately, first getting to secondary, then to tertiary and grey, and then adding white to get to the tone. Because I've been using the technique for some 20 years, if you watch my painting demonstrations, you'll see that I mix spontaneously, intuitively knowing where I need to be. I always pre-mix an approximation of the colours and tones that I need using a palette knife which keeps my base colours clean. But if I need to refine them as I'm painting, then I add dashes of primary colour or intermix my tertiaries using my brush. You'll often find that the secondary you've chosen doesn't quite give you the colour you're looking for when you've got down to the tertiary or grey, and that you need to add a touch of primary to get you into the target area. So here are the grey mixes for the first passage of the sketch. As I'm working, the premixed colours and tones are constantly being adjusted on the palette to pin down the nuance of colours in the subject, because I must not lose sight of the contrast and tonal relationships. In the sunny area of the river, the colour is predominantly blue, but I can see some yellow-greens and mid-greens. And in this area that is reflecting the cliff face, 
I can see some more red-orange, and at the bottom, in the darker water, there's a tendency towards blue-purple. I still have the mixes from the first passage on my palette and only need to mix the necessary blues and some mid-orange grey. The tone of the cliff face has set the tonal scale for the rest of the sketch and when painting the water I'm not only concerned that I've mixed the colours correctly but that the tonal relationship where the cliff meets the water is carefully portrayed. Where the sun is catching the tops of the trees, there are definitely some blue-greens mixed in with mid-greens. I can also see some subdued browns that I'll get to by mixing some mid to yellow orange. In the shrubs next to the boathouse, caught in the sunlight, I see red-orange. The shadow under the trees where the boats are laying is a very dark blue-green. The grass in shadow on the quayside is another blue-green but of a slightly lighter tone and in the dark area of water reflecting the shadow under the trees is a mixture of blue-green and blue-purple. As the sketch progresses the palette starts to fill up and I only need to supplement these mixed colours with new ones as I move into the next passage of the sketch. The existing mixed colours help me to gauge the tonal relationships with the latest additions. Because I'm using such a restricted palette, many of the colours will be compromises. But as long as I concentrate on tone and contrast, the mood of the sketch should be assured, and the tertiary and greys will always harmonise. As always, I'm comparing the relative tones of the colours next to and surrounding the colours that I'm laying down, spreading my way out across the composition. Now once the colours have been blocked in, I can start detailing anywhere in the scene, safe in the knowledge that the background colours and tones are correct. I now plunge into the shadow with my blue-greens. This is the darkest passage of the painting that will start to throw out and enhance the colours and tones of the lighter areas. I'm not interested in detail, but just add a few flicks of the lighter mid-green tertiary to suggest foliage caught in the sunlight. A slightly lighter blue-green-grey adds some modulation to the reflection in the water and the final bridge in the shadows can be completed with the lighter blue-green tertiaries of the grass on the quayside and the red-orange-grey for the shrubs next to the boathouse. And I can see that the tonal scale of the sketch is holding together. I use a kaleidoscope of tertiaries and greys in the reflection of the boathouse still keeping a wary eye on the tones of course and once the boathouse reflection is finished I can see that the blue purple of the open water at the bottom needs to be darker. The only colours that I don't have now pre-mixed on the palette are the secondary red orange for the boathouse and the secondary blue purple for the boat and the shadows. Once these are mixed, 
I have the complete set of colors to finish the sketch. The pink of the boathouse is the biggest compromise. If I would added crimson red to the palette, for example, I could have got closer, but it won't detract from the overall effect. A couple of lines of shadow for the thatch overhang and the balcony gives the three-dimensional shape of the boathouse. And it's amazing how dark the grey tone has to be to settle the white hulls of the boats into the shadows. A few added lines of detail, such as the masts of the dinghies and the windows of the boathouse, complete the overall effect. And if I remove the colour and desaturate it to black and white, I think you'll agree that the tones hold the quiet serenity of the sunlight scene pretty well. Colour harmony can be expressed as an arrangement of colours that are attractive and pleasing to the eye. However, art is a question of taste, and what may be discordant to one person may be exciting and vibrant to another. Before getting into a lot of confusing theory, I want to first look at those practical aspects of colour harmony that can be helpful to those learning to paint. In colour mixing I've shown how to create secondary, tertiary and grey colours and I'm now going to group them into what I call the secondary, tertiary and grey palettes. The first thing to understand is that the closer colours get to the grey palette, the easier they blend together and harmonise. If you're stepping out of the comfort zone of black and white monochrome, where you've built up your confidence in controlling tone and contrast, by using the grey palette you can freely apply colour without concern. The colours in the grey palette sit comfortably together. It doesn't result in a very sparkling colour scheme, but providing the tones of the painting are correct, the colours will be acceptable and contribute to the mood of the painting. It's also good to realise that by introducing the tertiary palette and combining it with the grey palette, that colour harmony will still remain safe and that there's still very little chance of colours clashing. I have to sound a word of caution when stepping up into the secondary palette. In this realm, where the brighter colours range over the full tonal scale, colour clashes and discords become far more prevalent. There's no need to be put off, and as long as these brighter colours are used as jewels in the crown within the general tertiary and grey palette background, they can be dropped into the composition and will sparkle. They can be very useful in drawing viewers' attention to the intended focal point. If you only ever get this far in the application of colours to achieve an overall harmony, you can spend a lifetime exploring the endless possibilities. The last thing I want to mention before getting on to colour theory is the effect of aerial perspective on colour. We know that tone and contrast diminish as things recede into the distance caused by the effect of haze, mist or fog in the atmosphere, but it should be noted that colours will also lose their intensity passing from secondary through tertiary to grey. It can be strikingly obvious in the dramatic silhouettes of receding mountains, but can be much more subtle in landscapes during haze or mist, where these colour changes occur over a much shorter distance. 
So I've now covered my horizontal and vertical approach to mixing colours, which I hope you've found quite easy to follow. And from there, explained how colour harmony can be very easily achieved by using the grey palette and the tertiary palette and adding then highlights of the secondary colours. Now I want to go into colour theory and to start with we'll have a look at the colour wheel. Firstly the wheel is divided into three equal segments and the primary colours are placed at the intersections on the circumference of the circle. The secondary colours that we get from horizontal mixing are then spaced equally in the segments between the primaries. The tertiary colours from vertical mixing can be shown as an inner circle and in the very centre we reach the neutral grey. My working palette consists of only primary colours. I use three reds, three blues and three yellows, which I've chosen very carefully. I paint in acrylics and water mixable oils, and the equivalent colours from both ranges sit at about the same position on the coloured circle. This picture of my working palette can be found in the technique section of my website. As already mentioned, my true primaries are Madder Lake, Thalo blue and cadmium yellow medium, which I place at the intersections. Primary magenta tends towards red purple, whereas pyrrole red tends towards red orange. Ultramarine tends towards blue purple, but primary cyan is on the blue-green side of the line. Yellow ochre is a yellow-orange earth colour, whereas cadmium lemon leans towards yellow-green. It is this colour wheel that is used as a tool to explain the theory of colour relationships and colour harmony. This theory involves grouping colours in different relationships within the wheel, under such headings as complementary, analogous, triadic, split complementary, tetradic and square. This theory of colour relationships may be useful to those who are involved in advertising and publicity and the design of house styles and uh, logos and websites, but not very practical for artists struggling with the complexities of landscape, portrait, still life or flower paintings. There are, however, two aspects of this theory which we can grasp and apply to our advantage. The first is the analogous relationship, which simply means that colours sitting next to one another on a circle are harmonious. This can be stretched to colours within a quarter of the circle. But bear in mind that this relates to the secondary colours on the circle. We already know that tertiary and grey colours are harmonious. The other relationship is not so obvious, but it's very important to understand, and that is the complementary colours. Colours diagonally opposite each other on a colour wheel are complementary. Now what does that mean? The theory says that when placed side by side, they create a strong colour contrast and make each other more intense and vibrant. Being on opposite sides of the circle, one colour is warm while the other is cool. Let's put it to the test. It works best if one of the complementary colours dominates the painting, the other bringing smaller accents into the composition. Of course, the rule applies across every diagonal of the colour wheel, and for the full range of tonal values for each complementary colour, and is also valid for the tertiaries along the same diagonal. This is all well and good, but the question is, how do you translate this into the practicalities of painting? The best way for me to show you is by way of examples. In these paintings I'm showing on the accompanying colour wheel the groups of analogous colours and their corresponding complementaries that I've used. 
It works best if the analogous colours dominate the painting and the complementary colours play a lesser role. With this approach to colour harmony in a painting, rather than simply recording the colours presented to you in nature, it involves a predetermination of the colour scheme. Of course, it doesn't preclude the use of primary and secondary accents from elsewhere on the colour circle. It's taken me years of study to understand colour and to get to grips with its application in painting. These days I'm using my aquatic paintings as the basis for further experimentation and introduction of more abstract forms. This is diverting away from the classical form of colour harmony and I'm trying to add a bit more jazz. Thanks for listening to me, I hope it's proved helpful and that you'll join me on my next video when I'm going to give a demonstration of one of my aquatic paintings using water mixable oil colours. I'll see you there.